is the, the final week of this series. We've been talking about all of these topics that uh, often don't get discussed. And for a variety of reasons, whether they're hot topics, whether they're sensitive subjects, we often try to shy away from things that could bring discord, that could step on people's toes. And that's a natural human reaction. Naturally, we don't want to, to have to have conversations about hard things because we know that maybe we'll have different opinions, Maybe we might offend, whether intentionally or unintentionally, based on our stances or positions. And so we feel it's important that we don't just ignore the giant elephant in the room, but that we talk about it. Because a giant elephant that is not discussed, a giant elephant that is ignored, often causes way more damage than should you just discuss whatever topic is creating the conflict. And so we, we devised this series and we came up with a, a variety of different topics that we felt were elephants in the room, things that needed to be discussed. And this last one that we have, um, it kind of in a lot of ways encompasses um, some of the other topics that, that we've discussed but it, it's this underlying idea of apathy, okay? We're going to talk about apathy. And, and, and some of you may think, okay, you know, how is this an elephant? How is this something that, that everyone is dealing with, but that maybe nobody is talking about? And, and we're going to dive into specifically how apathy is affecting the church, the people of God. We're going to talk about how this concept of apathy is creating a, a really serious problem in the church, and often we're not talking about it. We're placing blame on a variety of different things when in reality, it's actually apathy that's causing the root issue. It's actually this idea of apathy that is, is permeating the church and creating a lot more problems than we realize. And, and we think that the problems are, are being triggered by some of these other ideas or topics, but really apathy is the problem. So we're going we're gonna to define, just make sure we're all on the same page as to what we mean by apathy. Apathy is a lack of feeling interest or any particular concern about a specific situation or life in general, okay? So apathy, this idea of being apathetic towards something, is a lack of feeling interest or any particular concern about a specific situation or life in general, now today, as we talk about this idea of apathy, as we discuss how apathy is negatively impacting the people of God, it may trigger some emotion. And that is the goal. Because this idea of apathy often has to do with how we feel about certain things. And so the, the hope, the intent of the delivery of this message is to make you feel a certain way about sin, about evil, about corruption. It's, it's made to, to make you feel and to become burdened and passioned for righteousness, for holiness, because that's what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be on fire for the things that God loves, and we are supposed to oppose, resist, and flee from the things that God hates. And so today's elephant specifically is apathetic attitudes or mindsets towards following Christ, the Great Commission, and really just obedience to the Word of God. We're going to discuss how apathetic mindsets and attitudes 
have become commonplace in the church and when we should be on fire, when we should be burdened and driven, we've become callous and we've turned to nothing. So before we dive even deeper into apathy, I want to talk about what apathy isn't. Because for a long time, I had this general idea that apathy was synonymous with laziness, okay? And as I was researching and preparing for this, for this message, laziness has more to do with choosing not to exert energy or do work when you have the ability to do so. And, and the scriptures are very... Um, clear, they, they discuss the idea of, of laziness or slothfulness and how the people of God should not be lazy, but should be the hardest workers there is. And the people of God should work heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And so because we work for the Lord and we are representing him, we work hard. But, but apathy is a little different than laziness because we have some people who are very hard workers, who are not lazy, but have become apathetic towards issues that matter to God, but that have become irrelevant to us. And so don't, I don't want you to confuse this idea of apathy with laziness. <clears throat> when I was younger, my mom used to, and shout out to mom on Mother's Day, you're the greatest. Um, <laughs> She used to use this word, desensitized. Did any of your moms ever use that word? Okay, so you see, when I was a young lad, I used to like video games. And particularly the ones where you use guns and weapons, and there's violence. And she hated, she hated when I would play them. And she would always say, you're going to become desensitized to violence. You're going to become desensitized to violence. And, and I think um, Pastor Ron used this analogy maybe a couple of weeks ago. But she would also use this analogy, and, sh and she would talk about the poop in the brownie. I probably used this analogy myself many, many times. And what's funny is when I was a kid, I always said, Mom, that's the dumbest analogy. Why do you keep talking about poop in the brownie? And here I am <laughs> using the same analogy. But, but we as, as people, we have become numb or callous to the poop that's in the brownie. We, we have become numb to the fact that our lives are surrounded by evil and corruption and things that God hates. And, and now we just justify it. And we say things like, well, it's just, like a, it's just a little bit of poop in the brownie. It's still 90% brownie. So, you know, it's, it's fine. You know, you can hardly taste it. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. And if you don't think about it, then actually you don't even realize it. And matter of fact, if I don't tell you, you wouldn't even know it was there. It's still poop in the brownie, right? I know, it's crude. We shouldn't use that analogy. But you get what I'm saying. You see, when we become desensitized, we have been made less sensitive to. Very simple definition. When we become desensitized, we are becoming less sensitive towards something. And so when you surround yourself with violence, you become desensitized to violence. When you fill your mind with, with foul language and you're around it all the time, before you know it, you don't even, re you don't even hear it anymore. Like you don't even notice. You ever, you ever been watching a show and you don't think twice about what's happening in the show? And then mom walks in. And all of a sudden, this show that you're watching <coughs> is the worst show you've ever seen. And you're like, mom, I swear, I have no idea. This has never happened on this show before. I promise you. This is one, one time. 
Okay, there was this one cartoon. I still remember this to this day. There was this one cartoon I, was, I used to watch when I was a kid. I won't even say what it is. And it was this innocent, perfect cartoon in my mind, right? And this one episode, this one episode has this character who is part of the story, and he's like a sorcerer, and he, he's, he's doing some magic with some stones. And of course, I mean, of course, that scene is the scene that mom walks into the room, right? And she's like, what are you watching? I'm like, mom, I, it's, I, I, it's, it's nothing. She's like, turn it off. You're never watching this show again. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> it would happen all the time. I'd be watching a show. I would think it's perfectly fine. And then you're watching it with your kids. And you're like, wow, this show is awful. My goodness. All right, well, we're never watching this show again. But, but what happens is when someone else is around, our senses become heightened. We become more aware of just how desensitized we've become to what we fill our minds with. Right? I, was, I remember um, my parents did not let me watch, uh, um, listen to secular music growing up. And I remember having this debate one time in the car with my dad about why I should be allowed to listen to country music. And he was like, you think you should be allowed to listen to country music? I'm like, yeah, it's not a big deal. It's not even bad. He's like, all right, let's just flip over to the country station. I'm like, okay. So we flip over to the country station, right? The first song that comes on, I'm like, oh gosh, this is why this song, you know? Like why this, of course, this is the one that I have to defend my position on country music of. And it's, you know, talking about all kinds of inappropriate things. I'm like, well, dad, I won't listen to that one. And he's like, of course you won't, right? Because you won't listen to the country radio in which you have no choice over what songs come on. I'm like, yeah, but it's not a big deal, I promise. It's not a big deal because my, my friends listen to it. And so I want to be able to listen to it. And I don't want to feel guilty about listening to things that I know I shouldn't listen to and so I want you to approve of it is what I was saying. It wasn't going to happen. You see, when we are desensitized, we've been made less likely to feel shock or distress at scenes of cruelty or suffering by overexposure to such images and, and, and you, could, you could use that definition and you could plug in anything that you wanted to. We've been made less likely to feel shock or distress at scenes of sexuality and nudity because we've become overexposed. We feel less likely to feel shock or distress at inappropriate homosexual actions, behaviors, lifestyles because we've been overexposed to it. We feel less likely to feel shock or distress about immorality and unrighteousness. We feel less likely to feel shock or distress about things that grieve the heart of God because we've just been overexposed to it. You see, when we are desensitized, we are emotionally insensitive or callous to an idea, a choice, an action, or a behavior. We've become apathetic towards worldliness. And the church, the people of God, the ones who God has, has revealed himself to, the ones who God has called out of this world, we are the ones who are supposed to be born again. We are the ones who are supposed to be renewed and transformed. We are the ones who are supposed to hate what God hates and love what God loves. And we have become a people that looks for every excuse we can possibly find to let the world infiltrate our midst. Some new modern pop culture thing happens and you know what we do? We gather around and we say, how can we fit this into the church so that we don't look offensive to the world? Some, some ideas, some, some, some social media, some you name it, something happening in the school, something happening at work, something comes up 
in culture. And rather than saying, man, that's, the Bible's clear about that. We're going to stay away from it completely. We're not even going to associate with it in any way whatsoever. We try to figure out how to weasel it into what we're doing so that we don't create enemies. And all we're doing is becoming callous to the heart of God. You see, the, 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 this idea of being callous comes from getting a callous, right? You, you, you get enough friction on your hands from lifting weights and eventually you develop calluses so that when you lift, your hands don't hurt. And at first, they hurt a lot. You get lots of calluses. Sometimes the calluses even peel and it pulls back the wounds and, it, and it's, hurt, it's painful. My family, we commercial fish every summer. And the beginning of the fishing season, my hands are not equipped to handle commercial fishing. They've become weak. They've become soft. But by the end of the year, I develop enough calluses and my hands become so swollen that you don't feel it. But if you're not out fishing regularly, eventually the calluses go away. But while you're constantly fishing, picking fish, working with your hands, you develop the calluses. You stay them on your feet when you're running. And, it, and it's, it's, a natural, it's a natural reaction of the body to develop calluses where there's friction, where there's tension, so that there's not pain. Well, this idea of becoming callous is all throughout Scripture, except for when it's, when it's referring to callousness, it's not referring to the calluses on your hands or your feet. It's referring to the callousness of your heart. You see, God didn't create humanity to just tolerate corruption. But after we filled our minds and our lives with corruption for so long, eventually we become callous to it. We no longer feel the friction because our heart has built up the extra skin around it to protect itself from the conviction that you once felt. Right? And I think everybody in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because the moment you first sin, you go, oh, that hurt. That was not good. Right? You become a believer. You follow Jesus. You get the Holy Spirit. You do something wrong, and the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Hey, that's, that's not appropriate behavior for a follower of Christ. You start reading the Word, and you start seeing what God commands us to do, and the Holy Spirit's convicting you as you read, saying, hey, you do all those things, and you need to stop, right? But eventually, if you read that Word, and you go, man, I'm not supposed to do that, and you feel that Holy Spirit saying, hey, you should quit those actions, and you say, yeah, but maybe I'll quit tomorrow. And then you do that over and over and over and over again, day after day after day after day, and eventually... Your heart becomes callous to the Spirit. Eventually, the friction of the Spirit, where the Spirit was rubbing on your heart saying, hey, that's not good. Hey, you don't want to do that. Hey, that's not righteous. That's not holy. That's not befitting of a follower of Jesus. You just, that friction eventually creates a callous if you don't lean in and listen to it. Right, so you're sitting there and you're watching Netflix and you're watching a show that you're three seasons into and you're, it's a great show, right? It's a, it's a fantastic show. You're three seasons in and then all of a sudden season four is full of nudity. And you're like, but I'm already so, like, I'm so deep in the show that it's, it's fine, right? Or this happened in a particular show, a show that you like, um, it's clean, it's wholesome, and it tanks. So it gets bought out by a different company and then the new season becomes rated mature and it's just full of language, full of violence, full of sex, and you've gotta decide, do I stay engrossed in the story or do I just say it's not worth my soul and turn it off and never look back? <laughs> or your music, right? Your music that you just, you turn on when you need to turn off. 
and you just, you just play your music, and you really, to a degree, have actually, it's true, you've stopped listening to the words. And so when somebody says, hey, why do you listen to that? You're like, well, I just listen to it for the, for the beat, for the rhythm, for the way that it makes me feel. And maybe that's to, a, to an extent true, but it's because you've stopped listening to the words. But when you print off the lyrics and you start reading them, you go, wow, that's trash. Amen. Wow. God would not be happy to find me listening to that. Right? Or I was, I was actually just having this conversation with some seventh graders in my small group, and uh, we were talking about video games, right? And um, they were talking about the, you know, playing online video games. And parents, if you didn't know this, your, your kids, if they're allowed to play online, can pretty much play with anybody they want. And uh, the comment was made, well, why do, we, why do we play video games when it's just full of language, full of cursing? And what the, the response that I got from the seventh grader was, well, it's pretty much impossible to find a video game these day, days that doesn't have cursing, and especially when you're playing with people online. So, like, what are you supposed to do? Just not play video games? Hello. <laughs> I was like, whoa, you're getting it. <laughs> you're getting it. You made that conclusion all on your own. I didn't even have to tell you. Right? Because they become callous. Because it's impossible to find a video game that doesn't curse, so what's the big deal anymore? Right? Like, if I'm going to play online, I'm gonna pl I know I'm going to play with random strangers, and I don't control what language they use, so what am I supposed to do about it? Just a little bit of poop. Right? And social media. Preston, uh, Pastor Preston talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Man, social media. We justify all the reasons why... It's okay, it's acceptable. And we scroll and we say, you know, oh, I, I just have it to, to keep up with my friends. I just have it to keep up with my family. But we also follow those accounts that we know are gonna create dissatisfaction in our lives, right? So we, we justify keeping social media so that we can stay connected with our family and our friends that live out of state while we also simultaneously follow all the accounts, all the accounts of, of the women or the men or, or, or the various people that are just creating dissatisfaction in our hearts because we look at them with jealousy and go, man, I wish I had that. And even though it's just sowing a small seed of discontentment every time we hop on social media, we justify it because we say, well, that's just one negative aspect of social media, but the other part's good. So I'll tolerate what creates sin inside of me because of the potential of what might be good. Don't you think that's exactly what the enemy wants to do? Don't you think that's his scheme? The scheme is, hey, give them just enough good that they fall asleep to the bad. Give them just enough good that they'll ignore the bad. And then we'll just slowly increase how much bad until they become so callous to it, they don't realize we have control of their minds. That's what he does, right? Just like in anything in life, anything in life, the devil doesn't just come out and say, I'm wicked and corrupt. I mean, sometimes actually he does. <coughs> he does do that. But he's, <coughs> excuse me, he's an angel of light. He comes as the father of lies to steal, kill, and destroy, to deceive and so how's he going to deceive you? He's not going to say, hey, come worship me, the devil. You're going to say, no, I don't do that. I follow Jesus. What's he going to say? Hey, you know, this show is really entertaining. It's really entertaining. And it's funny, right? And, and we just justify all kinds of corruption under the banner of funny comedy, right? We, we tell corrupt jokes, 
but it's okay because it's funny and it's a joke, right? So we didn't mean it. You think God's laughing? No. Matthew, Matthew 11. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, has grown callous. And with their ears, they can barely hear, and their eyes, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people from the past longed to see what you see, the Messiah, and did not see it, and longed to hear what you hear, but did not get to hear it. Unfortunately, the church, and in and, and a similar, a similar um, quote, almost the exact same quote is quoted again in Acts chapter 28, and Paul is talking to, to the Jews, and what he's saying is the Jews had become callous, and so the message of the gospel was then going to be preached to the Gentiles because their hearts were ready to receive the message of the gospel, right? And here we are 2,000 years later, and we, the Gentiles, who were originally ripe for the gospel, have become just as callous. We have become so desensitized to the corruption of the world, we, the church, have become so accepting of evil that when we read this passage, we go, oh, that kind of hurts. I think it's describing me. I think it's describing me. Ephesians 4, now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way that you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. But only such as is good for building up. And as fits the occasion, that it may great, give grace to everyone who hears. So you're saying I shouldn't talk about things that I don't know to be 100% fact because having empty conversations about speculation that could potentially create discord is a sin? Hmm. So you're saying even if I'm having a 
relatively private conversation with a friend, if I've got nothing to, nice to say about another person for no reason, I probably just shouldn't say it. Hmm. So you're saying that as a, as a follower of Jesus, if anything comes out of my mouth that isn't building up the people that are around me, I shouldn't even go there. The church, we could spend the rest of our lives trying to figure that one out. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not sit and listen to the Holy Spirit tell you not to do something and then go do it. Guess what? That breaks the heart of the Holy Spirit. That grieves the heart of the Holy Spirit when he was given to us as a helper and then we disregard his help and say, no, no, it's fine. God doesn't care. I'll just keep doing it. It's no big deal. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Church, we could, we could go through the scriptures for three straight days and look at all the things that God hates and ask ourselves the question, how have we become callous to his commands? How have we gotten to a point where we don't even notice it anymore? We don't even see it. We watch movies with it, listen to music with it. Heck, we ourselves do it. And the truth is, we actually don't feel conviction about it anymore. Isn't that crazy? We actually have gotten to the point where we legitimately don't get that sick to your stomach feeling anymore. And so then we say things like, well, I don't feel any conviction about it. I'm sorry. I didn't realize in the Bible where it said, don't do these things, but if you don't feel any conviction about it, it's okay. That's, that's not in there. It says, don't get drunk. It says, don't incite your children to wrath. It says, flee from all sexual immorality. Not flee from all sexual immorality, except when you're by yourself all alone, then it's acceptable. Amen. It doesn't say flee all sexual immorality, except for when there's this new blockbuster hit out in theaters and everyone's going to watch it and you don't want to be the loser who's not seen it. So, it's, so go watch it. I was talking backstage with some of the families as uh, we were coming out here to dedicate our children and I said, man, this, this is one of those sermons that, that as you get asked to preach on it and you start preparing, you go, oh my goodness, I should not be talking about this <laughs> because uh, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm, I'm going through all this stuff and I'm just like, oof. Well, I guess I'm throwing my TV out the door when I get home. But, but, but in reality, church, we always say, but it's not that bad. But it's, but it's not that bad. Do I really have to throw my TV out the window, right? You don't. But here's, here's what's going to happen. You'll go home, and you'll maybe delete a subscription to Netflix or to Amazon Prime or to some other TV series. And a couple of months will go by and you'll feel good about it. And then this new show will come out and all your friends will be talking about it. And they'll be like, you gotta watch it. So you'll be like, okay. And then you'll go watch it. And then a couple of episodes in, it'll just have a little bit of poop in the brownie. And you'll go, it's just a little bit, it's no big deal. And then three years from now, you'll be right back in the exact same spot you were just fully indulging yourselves in the things that God hates. Because rather than fleeing, we tow the line. We tow the line and we see just how close we can get. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. Because he's just looking for a little bit of access to your life. The enemy's just looking for a little bit of access to your life. 
He's just looking for one tiny little stronghold. And then you give him that stronghold and he doesn't let go. And then you give him another one. And you give him another one. And before you know it, he's got his teeth sunk into you and you don't even know it. The enemy has gained control of your life. He's gained control of your emotions. And before you know it, you're being fully persuaded about lies based on social media without knowing an ounce of the truth and you didn't even realize it because you are calloused. You are calloused to the truth. You are calloused to righteousness. You are calloused to holiness. And we, the church, we, the people of God, commissioned by God to go out and make disciples and to embody the character of God, need to ask ourselves, am I tolerating, approving of the things that God hates? What does God hate? Let's just read some things God hates. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. So every time we tell a white lie, every time we say anything but that which we know to be the truth, God hates it. We don't seem to think much about it. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. And some of us might be thinking, well, I don't do most of those things. But how much of your life is filled with forms of media that market these things as if it's good. One of my favorite shows used to be Criminal Minds. And there was something about the intrigue and the mystery and the problem solving and, and the intellect. And I look back on that show and I think it was full of corruption, full of things that God hates, you know, and I swept it under the rug because it, was, it wasn't real, right? It's just a show. But we have so many things that we do that to. Proverbs 8, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate says God. Hmm. But we love our superheroes to be arrogant and prideful, don't we? And we love praising them for it. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Psalm 5, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. Psalm 11, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Isaiah 61, for I, the Lord, love justice and I hate robbery and wrong. Zechariah 8, do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath for all these things I hate declares the Lord. Church, there's a really big problem that we, myself, that we, the church, have. And it's a problem that we're really not talking about it because we know that if we talk about it too long, we're going to actually have to do something about it. And it's this idea of apathy. We have become completely calloused to what God hates. We have become completely blind 
desensitized to the corruption of this world. To where these days, when it comes to the transgender movement and the mutilation of children, we say things like, well, that's just the culture these days. You know what? Three generations from now, our kid's going to go, why didn't our parents do something about this? Why didn't our parents wake up? Why didn't our parents become activists for God's morality? Why didn't our parents and our grandparents take the oath of being a follower of Christ more seriously? And why didn't they fully dedicate every minute of their life to fighting evil? Right, because the the world our children are going to live in is going to be this times a thousand. Right, the, the rate of progression that our culture and our country is going down is awful. And our grandchildren and our children are going to grow up. And we talk about it. We say things like, man, I hate to see the world my kids are going to grow up in. Well, then do something about it. That don't, don't sit there. Don't sit there and say, well, you know, it's just... It's the way of the world. I'm just going to keep my business. I'm going I'm to live my life. I'm going to make my money. I'm going to retire. I'm going to, you know, raise my family. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to genuinely shield myself from the things of this world so that I don't have to think about it. Because if I think about it, it makes me realize I should probably do something about it. But I don't want to uproot my comfort zone. So I'm not going to do something about it. I'm going to ignore it. And then I'm going to say, well, I won't raise my kid to tolerate that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, the world and the people of the world just continue to go further and further and further away from God. And we, the ones who are supposed to be the imagers of God, do nothing about it. You see, the thing about being an imager of God is that you must actually reflect the image of God. And I don't foresee God doing nothing about evil. Matter of fact, I know that God doesn't do anything, doesn't do nothing when it comes to evil because throughout history, we saw God go to arms against evil. We saw God fight and eradicate evil. We saw God take the nation of Israel and say, when you go into my promised land before my presence can dwell in it, you must eradicate all the land of the evil so that my presence can then dwell in it. What did the people do? They said, yes, God, give us the land. Give us the inheritance. That's what we want. God said, okay, go eradicate all the evil. And they said, yes, God. One, two generations in, they're marrying the pagans, worshiping the false gods, and they look no different than all the Philistines in the land. Church, that's us. Most of the time, that's us. We're like, yeah, hate what God hates, love what God loves. Take care of the widow and the orphan. Yeah, feed the needy. Right? And then we don't do anything about it. And I don't say we as in the entity Mountain City Church. I say we as in the individual people of God who are supposed to be burdened for the word of God. Because we, the entity Mountain City Church, is only a reflection of you, the people Mountain City Church. So if we, the entity, Mountain City Church, want to become a church that is the salt and the light and the love of Christ, guess what? That means you. That means me. That doesn't mean this one serve day where we say, hey, everyone, go serve someone. That's a, it's a great idea, and it's a collective way for us to gather in effort and do it. But it means you in your workplace stand up for righteousness. You as a parent, stand up for righteousness. Shield your kid from evil. 
It means you as a teacher, as a policeman. It means you as a doctor. It means you as whatever you are, as a mom, as a dad. It means you be the salt and the light. It means you preserve the earth from destruction because of corruption. That's the call of the follower of Christ, the image bearer of God. We gotta wake up, church. We've been sleeping. We've been sleeping for quite a long time. And there's no one to blame for the downfall of our nation but us. There's no one to blame for the downfall of our public school system but us. There's no one to blame for the corruption of our culture but us. Because if the people of God, who are the image bearers of God, actually lived like God, on mission, passionately, on fire, for the Great Commission, if that was actually how the church existed for the last however many hundred years, our nation would be different. But we haven't done that. We fell asleep. We fell asleep and we became numb and callous. And before you knew it, we're gonna wake up and we're gonna go, wow, how did we get here? And the devil's gonna do everything he can to just keep you numb, hypnotized, asleep. Do something, church. We can't be the church that sits by. There's a reason that we are mountain city church, a city that is on a hill that cannot be hidden, the salt, the light, the love of Christ. There's a reason that's our mission statement. The question is, is it yours? The question is, is it yours? Have you made it your personal mission statement to be the salt, the light, and the love of Christ?